Hello and welcome to the Fort Collins Symphony Open Notes podcast. We are so excited to be joined by Stacy Garup. We're going to be performing Stacy's piece, Battle for the Ballot, on our November 5th concert, Escape to New Realms. Stacy, thanks so much for being here today. Jeremy, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Absolutely. Could you give us a quick overview for those that don't know you of who you are and what you do? Yes. I am a full time freelance composer that lives just outside of Chicago. I taught for 16 years at an academic institution from 2000 to 2016 before taking the, the great leap of faith into the, the unknown. <laughs> and I've really enjoyed having the time to compose, um, especially pieces like the Battle for the Ballot um, in the years since I've gone freelance. It's fantastic, yeah. And so we're gonna talk mostly about Battle for the Ballot today. And um, I believe you'll you'll be joining us in Fort Collins for that as well. So, yes. so everybody should definitely come out to those events, and we'll have more information about that and at the concert. Um, let's start with um, the inception of this piece. Where did where did it come from? What is it based on? If you could give us a, a broad overview of it. Sure. So, in the summer of 2019, um, the Cabrillo Festival got in touch with me and said that they wanted to commission a new work for narrator and orchestra that would be about the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. This was a real common thing that was happening back in that summer and time mm -hmm. period because it was the you know the 100th anniversary. So lots and lots of groups were, were commissioning new works from composers for this. So Christy Machalaruo, who was the conductor, he and I got on the phone and I asked what I really ask every uh, set of commissioners, which is, what are you looking for? What's important to you and your community? And he really wanted something that was, I had done a piece called Gloris Mahalia, which was about Mahalia Jackson and Studs Terkel. And it was a discussion that they had had on civil rights. And that's the piece that he heard that attracted him to my music. So he wanted something that would be um, in the, not necessarily the same, but you know, has some, has some sort of impact in the world of, of um, suffragists. So I went on a, a deep dive of uh, texts and speeches and everything I could written by different suffragists. And originally, I chose a speech that Susan B. Anthony had written in either 1872 or 1873 after she had been arrested for voting in the 1872 presidential election. And she went on a tour about, is it a crime for a woman to vote? So all was well and good for quite a while. Um, that Well, of course, the pandemic hit. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was not so well and good. But the point is, is that um, I wrote the piece, even though we knew that the, se the season wasn't going to happen. And then I get an email from Christy that, that said, do you think we can make a virtual recording of this? And at that point, it was like late April, early May of 2020. And um, people were already making these virtual videos. So we did. And but during the process of this, when George Floyd was murdered and all this, all the protests were happening, um, Cabrillo and I were getting more and more uncomfortable with the speech being by Susan B. Anthony. Um, there was a black string player who actually declined to take part in the Cabrillo project because wow. it was Susan B. Anthony. And that was yeah. for us a real red flag of, uh oh, what's going on here? I did a lot more research into Susan B. Anthony to realize that while she did remarkable work for the cause of suffragists, um, she also said some pretty bad things that uh, what you have to understand in history is that the 15th Amendment was coming up for the right of blacks to be citizens. And Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton were frustrated because they wanted universal voting rights. They didn't just want to start to parse out these packages. So they said some pretty nasty stuff. So at that point, uh, Cabrillo and I were so worried about this. They said, we will support you no matter what you do. And I said, give me a week. And I, in the space of a week, I was able to find um, different quotes by six additional, additional suffragists, four who are black and two who are white, that all go into the picture of wanting to get the right to vote. So the only trick with this is that the orchestra had already recorded their parts virtually in their wow. houses and the engineer had put all those parts together. And we knew from the original text that I only had 20 seconds where uh, a narrator could talk this line and six seconds here and 10 seconds. 
it was a mess. And so I had to sit there and find the text that would fit into the right block and tell a good story. So it was it was quite a, a crazy week. But at the end of it, I feel like the original text, which had been good, but, you know, it was going to be problematic, has turned into this wonderful tribute to all these women who were suffragists and men. And also it has become a call to action. So it's not just looking at it historically, hmm. but to say, look at how much they were striving. All of the texts are from before they gained the right to vote. So they are all unified, no matter how diverse they are, how whatever ways they're trying to argue to get the vote, they're all unified in how much they desire the vote. I love that that angle, that additional level of meaning that you put into it in that way. Yeah, that was a, it was one of those things that you, when you write it, you're like, this is good, I'm happy with it. And then when all <laughs> these problems start to come up and I realize, oh my goodness, this piece is on the wrong path and it's going to have a real short life unless I, in, it's going to get people upset unless I do something about it. And I'm very grateful that Cabrillo Festival gave me that week to go out and find these additional texts. And now it's like, I can't imagine the piece any other way. This yeah. is the right version of the piece and the only version that makes sense to my inner ear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I had heard in another, in your interview with Christy, um, that it was really difficult to find perspectives from black suffragists. Can you talk about that real quick? Yes, part of the problem is in all the original suffragist work that I'd done, the research, it was really all white suffragists that were being reported on. There is so little on the market, and even in the Library of Congress. So the, the photos that uh, I put together, this really nice uh, slideshow of photos, I was trying search term after search term in the Library of Congress in their archives to find pictures of Black suffragists, and there's just very, very few. Um, I was very fortunate that when um, Cabrillo and I had the conversation about enlarging the texts, I immediately got onto Amazon.com and there was a book that had just come on the market about black suffragists. So I ordered it, I practically overnighted it. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and did this with a couple other books too. I found everything I could, gathered them together read through the books. And when I found good quotes, I would go to the, you know, I checked the footnotes and would go to the websites to find the original text. And the thing that became paramount was the NAACP had started a magazine um, back around 1911, 1912. Hmm. And they had two different editions um, around, I think it was 1912, 1914, 1917, somewhere in there, that were devoted, sections were devoted to the suffragist movement. And that's where I found a lot of really good texts by Black suffragists um, and that I could craft into here. There are one or two suffragists that I really wanted to represent in here, but they just didn't have a quote that would really mm -hmm. fit the meaning of what I was trying to say. Because remember, the whole goal is they have to speak from before the point it was uh, ratified, before yeah. the 19th Amendment was ratified. So someone like Ida B. Wells, who is a Chica was a Chicagoan, and she was a reporter, and she she was amazing, but she did not have a quote I could find that would work into the narration I was trying to to craft. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Could you talk about um, the text that you chose and what what story you're telling in the piece? Yes. So <laughs> it's one of the things that really struck me about um, about suffragists and what they had to do. Is it's hard to imagine a point in life where women do not have the right to vote. Although mm -hmm. with what's happening with uh, the abortion law, Roe v. Roe v. Wade being struck down, we can see where you know the laws and the courts have so much impact on on our lives. But Susan B. Anthony was really aware of the fact that if she got married, she would lose all rights to her own belongings, to her children, to wow. owning property, to everything. And so she never got married as, as a result. She was, as she says, she was basically married to the cause. <laughs> um, but Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who she worked with extensively, had lots of kids and was married. And so you had an interesting pairing of people who were from each side of that spectrum. But I think um, it, it went further than that. They could not vote. They could not serve on a government. Um, you'll hear some texts in here that basically say these women are the educators 
of boys who ha- are just turning 21 or have fought in a war who barely know the country. And they're being allowed to vote before these women are. And it just, it was, you know, we've, we've heard about the whole taxation without representation. We hear that with the Re- American Revolution and how, you know, the colonies were so upset because of the tea, uh, the tea party and everything that happened out of that. It's the same thing. It's exactly mm-hmm. the same thing. These women were being required to pay taxes for a government that they were not allowed to participate in. So um, I think what the texts do really well is, you know, there's some by Carrie W. Clifford that says the ballot opens the schoolhouse and closes the saloon. It keeps the, pu- the food pure and the cost of living low, and it causes a park to grow where a dump pile grew before. It's that means that there were all these things were happening that were not really acceptable in society, and it takes regulation and laws to change this. And if, as a woman, you these things matter to you about opening a schoolhouse or closing a saloon, and you had no representation to do this, then that's a real problem. And there's another quote a little further in that says, "The right to petition is good." But it's much better when well voted in. And the (laughs) idea that women were allowed to petition for this cause or that cause, whatever they want, but that's all they could do. Yeah. And even in the musical Hamilton by Lin Manuel Miranda, late in the second act, there's a line about how uh, wives ask your husbands to vote for Adams or whatever it was. You know, just the idea that the women didn't have the power at all. They had to tell their husbands, you know, vote for this guy. So it's it's really striking to think that's where they were a hundred years ago, and these rights that we take for granted they just were not ever a sure thing until they finally got that that vote. Yeah, yeah. When I listened to it the other day, the taxation without representation was was the line that really stuck with me, and it's, um, I mean, it, it all just seems so obvious now. Yeah. From but, from today. But they fought for it for well over fifty years. Um, more than that, I think it was 70 years. I, if Seneca Falls was in 1848, then um, and it took all the way to 1919, then yeah. I mean, this is how long of a battle it was. Susan B. Anthony herself, who was one of the originators in this whole cause and the drive of it, she died in 1906. And, I didn't realize um, that. Yeah, and I believe her final public words were, failure is impossible. And... She didn't get to live to see her own dream, but that's how long of a cause she fought for. And that's why she she felt so strongly. So I think there's far more women than just her. We could go through each one and write a separate piece about each. But I do believe at the end of the day, having the chance to bring these texts together has really made the story that much stronger. And in particular, you can't tell who the speakers really are, unless you read the text, except for a couple moments when suddenly you become aware of the race of the speaker. Mm-hmm. And that has that was an interesting thing. Um, when I was working with, the, going through those texts during that crazy week, um, it, I came across this archaic wording that is the colored American. And um, I wrote to my contacts, one of them who um, her name is Bet- uh, Bettina Abdekar, and she works in uh, Santa Cruz and works with civil rights. I said, is this okay to do? This doesn't sound right to our, our modern ears. And she said, it is historical. It is exactly right. You should not be changing the words. Yeah. So that was that's a bit of a head turner for me every time I hear it. Um, but we, do, we have had um, some wording that we put at the beginning of the slideshow to help remind people that this is historical wording. That's why it's in there. Yeah. Yeah. How, what did you do in the music to, to accompany support or emphasize the texts? So originally, and this is kind of the beauty of it, when the idea of the original Susan B. Anthony speech was, she was laying out her cause about why we need the right to vote, why Mm -hmm. women need the right to vote. And the, the very last line of that text, sorry, <laughs> I'm looking for my piece of paper with the text on it. Oh, it's here. The very last line of the speech of the, all the narration is actually Susan B. Anthony's. And she says, we propose to fight our battle for the ballot all peaceably, but nevertheless persistently through to complete triumph. 
when all United States citizens shall be recognized as equals before the law. So that's the goal. That was the goal of all of the texts is that we are all working for that. Um, and when I pictured it with Susan B. Anthony, you'll hear about maybe, I think it's about 10 minutes or so of the music is responding to the text. And then you have a four minute interlude, more or less, three to four minute interlude. And that's in my head where Susan B. Anthony was seeing just this, the, the, all of her, all of that work that she's done come to fruition, yeah. that women are finally getting to the ballot box and they're finally voting in the waves and making change that's meaningful. So when I changed it to the battle for the ballot with the seven voices, it's the same picture. All the arguments are leading up to that three minute interlude where we, the music just swells and we hear, um, we can see it in our heads. And what you see on the screen in the slideshow is that um, we have been going th through, at the very beginning of the slideshow, one slide at a time of a woman or a couple women uh, trying to petition people to change the right. Yeah. And then we have a couple of pictures of different suffragists individually. And then you see them starting to organize. And by the time we get to that three minute or four minute interlude, now they're gathering and marching. So we start to see them marching in bigger and bigger numbers. And the, the most impressive picture at all is actually from, um, a, <laughs> it's from a march in 1913 in Washington, D.C. It looks like a mob scene. It's at the height of the piece, and it actually is a mob scene. So um, men began actually attacking women in that parade. I don't know if it was physically, but it was verbally for sure. And that actually is what led to having sympathy turn towards suffragism. Like, look at, you know, newspapers reported, look at what's happening. And look at these men attacking these women. So that is, for me, that's where all this comes together. Hmm. And then after that, then we see, as we hear the final words about how these women hope to get the right to vote, um, we see women actually voting. And, and that's historical footage as well. So we see women voting in that time <laughs> period. And the, the last slide of all is my favorite because it's these four women. It goes from one woman voting to, I think, three and then to four. And that one in the picture from Pittsburgh, one woman is looking directly at the camera. And it's unnerving to me every time I see her because it's like she's looking at us and saying, look what we achieved and what are you going to do to further what we've done? Yeah. And to me, that's the real call to action is that woman from Pittsburgh. Fantastic. I love I love you that you explain that that instrumental section. I listened to it the other day. Um, just just to sit down and experience it, the the version that that Cabrillo did, and I definitely heard the marches. I wrote, I was writing down, I was taking notes, and I, I remember saying, I, I need to ask Stacy if this is supposed to be a march because I definitely, I definitely felt the feet forward, like unrelenting, and yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah, <laughs> that part has stayed the same. Like really, the piece has been identical. It's just lifting out, you know, one text and popping it in with you know, all these others, and with this, with all with the same meaning. But I did actually accentuate the music a little bit with like some militaristic sounds. Like mm -hmm. there's what I call like a gunshot motive where it's like da-da-da, da-da-da. And you hear it echoing around the percussion. Mm -hmm. Maybe not gunshot, actually, it's the wrong word, but more of a percussive role. And that's just because it helps bring to mind the idea of, of a, a march or a parade, whether it's um, whether or not it's something to do with the military. But I also wanted this feeling of striding. So you yeah. do get some feelings of that too. Mm -hmm. What other musical things should we listen for that we may not even right away know what they what they are? So the goal of the piece, um, this was the funny trade off. When you're writing for narrator and orchestra, um, I ended up realizing I'm really writing a concerto for mm -hmm. narrator mm -hmm. and orchestra, and that's because the most important thing is the text, making sure that the audience gets the text. So. I decided early on that meant that the music had to be a bit simpler. Um, with, it's actually quite funny. I was writing an a orchestra piece right before this called Goddess Triptych, which um, does all this crazy stuff. Lots of hijinks, lots of extended techniques. You know, just, whoa! <laughs> mm -hmm. And this one is the complete opposite, literally the opposite. It's very tonal, very, for the most part, slow building. But I did want to have a couple of effects. So one of them is there's a gliss or a, or a slide that you're going to hear. A, 
-hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. And it's to show that while everything on the surface is looking okay, things are not okay under the surface. Oh, okay. And you're going to hear that motive keep growing in throughout the whole piece. So that, that to me had a lot of significance. The other thing that I'm not expecting people to pick up on at all <laughs> is that the piece actually begins with um, a strike of the harp and piano, tubular bells, Kritalis and marimba all together, and it's a chime that we hear. And if anyone counts, there are 19 of them, with the last one being the final thing you hear in the piece. So <laughs> it's, it's little things like that, that that can be fun to put in, and you know, I don't think people are going to listen for that. The other thing that to me is striking, and I know this is a very geeky thing to say, is that the piece begins and ends on um, what is called the dominant chord in music. And that once you, after the first four minutes of being on this dominant chord, uh, you get to the tonic. This is reverse of mm. what should really happen in a piece. You should start with the tonic, a moment of less tension, and grow into something that is then feels like it has to return to the tonic. And the fact that I ended it on this open chord shows that the work isn't done. So it's, it's cute little games like that that I was having a lot of fun playing that, once again, helped me organize the piece that I don't expect people to hear. The glissandi slide stuff, the I do hope people hear that part. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for talking about the tonic and dominant and, that that's, and what that means at the end of the piece. One of the things I wanted to ask was... Um, was yeah was how this piece ends more in a philosophical way um and it sounds like it's it's ending with in 1919 with the beginning of voting and you said what's next that woman looking straight at the camera yeah yeah if you listen musically you don't know at what point they're really stopping like you know that uh, they're still working on achieving suffragism but when you are seeing the video presentation and when we get to the return of the opening material and you see that's when uh, we see a photo of one of the governors signing the 19th Amendment. And you'll, you'll know when you get there because it's one man at a desk and a whole bunch of women <laughs> like staring at what he's writing on. It's such a great photo. Um, and then after that, you see a woman being sworn in to, to vote. And then, going, you know, then you see them dropping their ballots in the box. Um, then you see it. You get it when you see the visual images that, yes, they have achieved the right. But yeah. when you listen to the music without the images, you don't know. And that's why if a tonic is really that nice place of being settled and the don dominant is where you create a tension that it has to return to a tonic, the idea of, of ending a piece on the dominant is like, yeah, the work is just incomplete. we got to keep going. Yeah. I love that. Is that something that you decided to do early on or is that something that just kind of ended up happening? No, I'm a really uh, formal composer, and what I mean that by that um, is I believe that form has to be determined to understand where the piece is going. So mm. I draw out forms using um, basically an x-axis and a y-axis, so tension is running along the x-axis, and then uh, ten time is running along the no, I did it wrong. Y axis is <laughs> tension, x axis is. You get that point. The point yeah. is, I'm tracking both time and tension. And I knew mm. that the piece had to open and close with the same sound. And if I made it a five chord, then everything in between is actually the resolution until we get back to that five chord. So there's things that I just structurally, once I understand a piece at that level, then I can start plugging in a lot of the other d decisions and the material. I love that. Thanks for that insight. <laughs> <laughs> This is a very geeky musical conversation. <laughs> but what I really appreciate is that you, you are everything you talk, everything you mention that's really geeky is you're explaining what that means in the music for the for the people who don't know tonic and dominant. You've done a really, really great job of explaining it. So Phew. again, thank you so much for that. <laughs> <laughs> so this is about the the opening section and the final section. Mm -hmm. um, what's striking to me about the text for these two sections is when the piece begins, you hear the narrator say, woman's suffrage is coming, you know it. And then the piece begins. That particular line was said by Carrie Chapman Catt, and she was addressing Congress. She was saying, basically, you guys, get with it. We know that woman's suffrage is coming, and you know it's coming. And when we get back to that um, same section, and you know because the music it repeats from the opening section to this ending section, we once again hear Carrie Chapman Cat. 
And she's now saying, the time for women's suffrage is come. The woman's hour has struck. And I love the pairing of those quotes uh, to open those two sections and being by the same, the same speaker. Because she's just saying, that's it, men. Get, get with it. This is it. We've amassed everything we can over the last 65, 70 years. Now let's just see this through. Yeah. Were, were those from the same speech? Yes. Okay. They're all okay. in the same speech. So that's why it was so much fun to say, if these are parallel sections of the piece, yeah. why don't I break up the quotes and put them at the same spot? So unless you... I wouldn't expect the audience to, to know that, but I do like the narrators to be aware that it is the same voice. Yeah. Um, and when I've, uh, when every narrator gets the, um, the quotes, they have a list of who said each quote under the quotation itself yeah. so they can see uh, whose voice they're speaking. Yeah. And that way they can see, oh, Carrie Chapman Cat. The other time that I used her, I, a couple other things were used by her as well, but those in particular match really well. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Stacey, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, our last question is just, what do you want people to take away from this piece? How do you want them to be um, after they've heard it? That's a very good question. <laughs> you know, I've thought a lot about it over the years um, as this piece has been been done um, by different groups. And I think what I want people to realize is that basically we have to fight for everything in life. Hmm. These women had no dream, no idea when they started the, the suffragist movement if they would ever achieve their goals. And many women never lived to see their goals achieved, but they knew they had to keep striving to make it happen because it mattered to them and it mattered that their kids would have a better life. And I think that's what I want to have people take away from this is no matter how things get uh, within our country or how people feel about things, we can keep striving to work to make it better. So I think that for me is the biggest picture of, of these courageous ladies. Yeah. Perfect. Well, again, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for writing this piece. We'll be um, we'll be performing it on November fifth, twenty twenty two, in Fort Collins, um, and you'll be there with us. I will be there. <laughs> I'm very excited to make the journey out and be with all of you. Perfect. <laughs>